In section 3.3, we're going to prove the intermediate value theorem. The intermediate value theorem states that if you have f, which is a continuous function on the closed interval a, b, and assuming that one end is not exactly the same as the other, then let's say we, if we pick any k that's in between values f, a, and f, b, it could be depending on which way f, a, and f, b goes, the point is the k is somewhere in there, then you can select a point inside a, b where f of the value of the x0 in a, b will be equal to k. And that's given any k inside that range from a, uh, from f, a to f, b. Now graphically, you can see this as, uh, say, if you have an interval from a to b, and then your graph, of course, goes somewhere. Uh, say, this is f, this is f, a here and this is fb, then you can cut across any value k between fa and b, and, uh, and you will be able to find an x0 where f of x0 is going to be going to be uh, equal to k. Now the reason is because f is continuous, okay? If it has a break there, then you don't have that uh, that's not as necessarily true, being that it's continuous, is obviously true in a way. However, we're going to prove this logically, this pr prove the logic, the obvious logical point. So to prove it, first we will mention a small theorem which says that says that if if a function f is uh, if f is continuous on a close on something, if f is continuous, then and if f of c, a certain point c, is bigger than zero, let's say, then then f is f is bigger than zero on a small interval that contains c, such as uh, c minus delta, c plus delta. Okay, I just uh, delta is small, so if we're just talking about small <coughs> interval. If we c, then there should be a tiny little neighborhood small enough such that f is going to be bigger than zero on the entire interval. And that's a direct re result of the delta epsilon definition of continuity. And But we will keep this in mind. In fact, we'll co call this thing, we'll call this particular interval j, Okay, a small interval where f is going to be bigger than zero because f contains a point in there. So c is a point of j. Now, continuing with our proof of the intermediate value theorem, we will prove by a contradiction, which becomes easier. So assume not true, okay? Assume that, assume is not true. Then we have, and we will define, let g of x equal to f of x minus k. And the reason is because that way we can start dealing with zeros because everything was all you're doing is drop down f of x to the to the bottom line so that you can see it easier. People can think better if if things are zero. So zero seems to be easier to handle. So if this is true, then it is clear if we assume the first condition, it doesn't really matter which f a is different from b, so it could be less than b. F a can be less than f b or bigger than f b. But we'll just take the first one for convenience. The second condition works exactly the same way for this argument. So let's say f of a is less than k, less than f of b, which means that um, then that means g of a is uh, less than zero. Okay, that's the negative one. And uh, g of b is going to be bigger than zero. And, uh, and based on assumption, if the, the intermediate value is not true, that would also mean the g of x is not equal to 0 for all x in the AB range. That's what it means by f of x cannot be equal to k is g of x cannot be 0. So then if g of x cannot be 0, then we will use the nesting theorem to trap something weird down. So the nest, by the nesting theorem, we'll be defined on this. I0 is just the original interval. OK. And then for I1, we will bisect. I1 is, uh, we define I1 by this way. It will bisect I0. 
and then choose I want will be the choose I want to be the one of the two intervals where you bisected. Choose interval with a, where where uh, one n g is uh, g is uh, zero is g is negative on one end and positive on the other. Let's see, uh, g is negative. positive to the other. Now remember the g of x is not zero, okay? Since g of x is not zero, it's either positive or negative. If it's negative, then we'll pick the second end. If it's positive, we'll pick the first end. Because just so that the two ends of the interval has different, has opposing signs. So then, and then we will continue doing so because we're tracking the oddity here. So I2 is, uh, definition is uh, similar to I1. If I set I1 and do the same thing. Uh, do the same thing, okay? You keep bisecting and picking the one interval where, is, uh, where there's a sign change. G goes somehow jumped from negative to positive in that interval. And you can always find that. So then eventually we arrive as a nest, a nest such that uh, I0 includes I1 and it keeps including and, uh, and so on. And also the, the length goes to zero because we're bisecting. So length of the IN will go to zero, which means we satisfy the nesting theorem, which we will con conclude then there exists a, a point C, okay? Everything will contain one point, a point C. The point C that belongs to all I n. And then we know that, uh, so, so then G has, uh, what is G of C? We'll consider this, con this little statement there. Now G of C is uh, going to be one sign, okay? We'll assume that it's bigger than zero, but it doesn't really matter. So G of C, is uh, going to be, well, we won't assume. G of C is uh, of one sign, bigger than zero or less than zero, but, but is of one sign at a small interval, in a small interval J, which is by this principle right here. But, but J also contains I N. I N is going to belong to J for some large N. Because C is inside J and C belongs to all the intervals I n. So then that would mean that G of C is of different signs. So that will arrive at our contradiction. And that concludes our proof. So you're trapping this oddity and then show that this uh, at this point, as this at there's a tiny little interval where G of C has to be the same sign, and yet G of C also contains I n, which means G of C has to be of opposite signs. And that is your contradiction. So that's the end of our proof.